Hi folks, this is a quickie here. We had a lot of response on our 100 mile per gallon carburetor uh, uh, series to date. And um, a lot of you have made some very interesting suggestions, but I need to clear up a few things. So here we go. Hi, David Bizard here, and you guys are watching Paratech 10. Stay with me while we go through some of the comments we've had on our 100 mile per gallon carburetor series, which so far is proving very popular. Lots of comments. Guys, please keep that up. First off, let's address what the subject of this series is. It is whether or not the 100 mile per gallon carburetor exists. So, that excludes your typical diesel engine to start with. So we don't talk about mileages with diesel engines. We may get onto that down the road. Nor, strictly speaking, should we be talking about these devices which vaporize the fuel with engine heat. But, because it's a honest search for a hundred miles per gallon I'll include those and look at see just what their viability is also we're not looking for how many miles per gallon can be had from a car that's built only to do mileage remember this has got to be a vehicle equipped with a carburetor which at some point in the speed range will give a hundred miles per gallon genuine it's got to have four seats it's got to do zero to 60 in a, about 10 seconds hopefully less but you know like the i think the honda that was way back in about 1980 which was still carbureted did zero to 60 in about 11 seconds well i'll allow that it did 52 to the gallon or 54 good effort Somebody said, why aren't we getting those figures now? Well, we'll get to that. Also, anybody who's saying, well, the guy down the road claims he's got, I want to hear that claim from him and what justifies it, right? No flabberty dab. I think that's a new phrase I've just invented there. But anyway, I think those ground rules are fairly explicit. Now let's talk about some of the applications here in terms of carburetors way back when and this was in the 19 early 1980s i would say about 1982 ish i got myself a very nice uh 350 chevy truck in 1974 been very well looked after it did have a problem though it was that nice inside that although it could be better i had to keep questioning whether or not i really needed to do it because at first glance it looked new it was only when you started to get really fussy about looking at it that it looked like it was a eight year old truck maybe 10 years old well anyway uh I finally did get it reupholstered inside because it really looked nice. And I also got it repainted by a guy who normally painted Rolls Royces. So it had a beautiful, very plain black finish on it. Some nice wide wheels and tires uh, on it. it. Was I lowered it, relocated suspension points, upgraded the brakes. But I also put in an engine intended to get decent mileage. Now this was a 350, it was about 10 to 1 compression ratio, so I had to watch the fuel that I put in there at the time. And uh, uh, it made 300 and, 
It was about 342 horsepower or 347 horsepower with about 445 foot-pounds of torque. Now you can tell for a 350, that's a, a walloping amount of torque. How well did it go? Well, I could blow off your typical BMW, no trouble, right? It was a short bed truck, so it weighed in at around about 3,000... 600 pounds uh, anyway the thing was is I used a, uh, a holly uh, I think you'd call them a spread bore two big barrels and two small ones right now this is a very much underrated carburetor but anyway I spent a lot of time doing part throttle calibrations on the primary on the road that truck really hauled i mean it was a high 13 second truck and driving it around town 22 to the gallon on the freeway 26 that's not too shabby oh the transmission was also gone through by um, art car transmissions i said i wanted a transmission that really shifted smoothly didn't have a lot of drag in it etc etc right so he rebuilt that i mean and it did shift nice i mean great stuff and uh, anyway the point is that i want to make here is that carburetor sizing does have an influence but only the sizing that the engine sees in other words, on this holly, the calibration of the idle, just off idle, and the transition into the primary main jets was very critical. And I think I probably spent two or three days on the dyno just tweaking that alone. Also, the Ignition was very critical as well. And uh, I used some experimental ignition on this. Uh, oh, yes. I was doing some stuff, I think, for Axel. And I used a distributor that was electronically advanced and retarded on both uh, RPM and vacuum. Right? So, when we talk about carburetors and sizing it's no good talking about a mustang that gets 40 to the gallon on a lawnmower carburetor because i'm sure if i drove at the speed he did to get 40 to the gallon with my truck i would have been real near it but if we raced it on the quarter mile i mean i doubt that his mustang would do better than about a 19 second quarter mile my truck would go 120 miles an hour, zero to 60 in under six seconds. Now, that's not make it doing 100 to the gallon, but I'm sure if I slowed down to about 50, I could have got very close to 30 to the gallon. And that was using stuff that was not special. Now, if anyone's got a very good uh, spread bore holly, out there and I mean it's got to look like new I'm interested in buying it so let me know about that now let's get down to uh, some other factors here anything that has stuff on it which makes it impractical to use on the road that is not very drivable and especially does not meet that 0 to 60 in about 10 second criteria you can mention it, but it doesn't count in this category. We are looking strictly for a carburetor that will deliver those kind of performances on a four-seat car that will do 100 miles per gallon somewhere in its usable speed range. That's the target. We're not trying to prove whether these vapor things exist or not, but the idea of delivering vapor to the engine is a good one. Now, consider this. There's a fuel that you can have to run your 
engine on that does very good miles per gallon, gives very good drivability and total vapour. It's called a propane carburetor, and I've done a few propane engines. They work very well. Now these, how shall I call them, pre-vaporized fuels like propane and hydrogen do come with some of their own problems. Let's not deal right now with the storage of it, which with hydrogen is especially problematical or can be. Uh, and I have to tell you now, I've got no experience with hydrogen fuels, so bear with me if I'm a, a little bit scant on telling you what uh, is good and what's bad here. But one thing is for sure, a, a fuel delivered to the intake system, not direct into the cylinder, as a gas, will cut the volumetric efficiency. Ideally, what we want is a fuel delivery system, and at this moment I'm talking about a carburetor, that will deliver something which is or closely resembles a vapour at part throttle economy cruising. But when it's called on to deliver maximum power, it can deliver fuel droplets small enough to burn easy in the cylinder, but not so small that they vaporize because that will cut the volumetric efficiency. Now, if we direct inject these fuels straight into the cylinder, I, haven't, I have not done this, but this might be a good route to go with a propane engine, and we inject it into the cylinder as the piston approaches TDC, if it can be done quick enough, then it will vaporize it will absorb some of the heat of, from the previous power stroke, which will cause it to expand, so we'll get a bit of power back from that. And it won't cut the volumetric efficiency because it's a charge that's delivered into a cylinder that is sealed up. So that might be a good point to uh, look at here. Let me sum up here what we've done. For our carburetor to even start to approach 100 miles per gallon, couple of things we've got to do. Make sure that it delivers consistent fuel mixture to the cylinder and it's sufficiently atomized slash vaporized so that it burns as if it was a vapor and it has to be lean. Now one last point here tonight I just think I said that. I'm going to show you a car which was done by Shell about 2020-ish, or it's, they started on it. Um, and this makes me suspect that fuel companies aren't anxious to buy up economy cars or an economy device and shelve it. Because here is the car that Shell did as an example for their competition for mileage. Can't remember what, what it's called now, but anyway, this doesn't quite meet our criteria, but it's what you should be looking at. Here is a picture of it. It is not a four-seater, it's a three-seater. However, it's running on an entirely gasoline engine, uh, about a 650cc, 43 horsepower, three-cylinder gasoline engine which has been tweaked for mileage. Now, the car weighs 1,250 pounds. It has an awesome drag coefficient down in the 0.2 something. I, don't quote me on this, but I think it's about 0.22 or 0.23, somewhere around there. Snag, only seats three people, so it doesn't quite meet our criterion. Also, Although the top speed of about 90 miles an hour is okay, the acceleration is abysmal, 0 to 60 in 15, almost 16 seconds. It could do with bumping up there. Now, 107 miles to the gallon at a constant 42 miles an hour. Now, I know it was fuel injected, so, but we could replace fuel injection with a carburetor if it was up to scratch. 
So that's an example. Now that's what we're shooting at. 100 miles per gallon for a four seat car at a decent cruising speed, 50 miles an hour. So we know that the, there's efficiency in the fuel and efficiency in the engine, or at least approaching it to do that. So let's see in the next edition what we can do about making this 100 mile per gallon more possible by putting less burden on it. Don't forget, I want lots of comments on what you think we can achieve here. Is that 100 mile per gallon carburetor still achievable in your mind or is it just too far out of reach? Let me know. Thank you for watching.